Good afternoon and welcome to Liberty Thon. My name is Chris Guevara and I'm chairperson of NYU Students for Libertarian Society. SLS is an organization dedicated to the creation of a free and open society. Our credo states that through education and action we seek to inspire a new American radicalism in pursuit of the rights to life, liberty, and justly acquired property. Since libertarianism is a political philosophy based on the axiom of non-aggression, that is that no individual should initiate the use of force against another, it identifies the state as the apparatus of coercion. As such, libertarians adopt consistent alternatives to both left and right. We are free market radicals in the purest sense of the word. We are absolute defenders of civil liberties and of the right of the individual to pursue diverse lifestyles and we are proponents of a non-interventionist foreign policy. Liberty Thon, which begins this afternoon and concludes tomorrow, is an attempt to present a comprehensive view of the libertarian challenge, and it, it features six lectures on the politics, economics, and philosophy of freedom. Our first lecture is on planned chaos, the failure of socialism, and it features Don Lavoy. At 2 o'clock, Dr. Murray Rothbard will present a talk on the crisis of American foreign policy, and that is followed at 3.30 by a discussion on the draft, which features Mark Jaffe, Alex Reyes, and Carol Moore. As for our first speaker, Don Lavoy, he is the editor of the Austrian Economics Newsletter, former economic instructor at Rutgers University, and he's presently writing his doctoral dissertation on the calculation debate here at NYU. Would you please welcome Don Lavoy? Thank you. Um, I was hoping there'd be some socialists here. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but uh, much of my talk is, uh, in a way, directed at trying to wean socialists in our direction. Nonetheless, I think it's uh, a useful uh, discussion and a useful sort of approach to be exposed before libertarians because uh, there are many ways in which a libertarian critique of socialism gives libertarian a ra the kind of radical flavor that we prefer, rather than simply pose ourselves as some kind of middle road between the Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it puts us on the battlefield between the radical socialists on the one hand and the radical liberty advocates on the other. I think that's a but much better battle for us to engage in, in other words. Um, ma the main reason I think that's better is because libertarianism is, like socialism, an attempt at constructing a principled ideology. Um, a principled ideology is a kind of a system of ideas that takes a, a basic vision of society the way it ought to be and applies that vision to every issue in the contemporary world and tries to devise the proper policy judgments on each of these issues. It is not the kind of power politics that takes place in, uh, you know, between Reagans and Andersons in, in the real world. Um, it's not the kind of special interest politics where uh, policy positions are chosen on the basis of what's good for me or what's good for my neighborhood or what's good for uh, people in my kind of job or my industry or whatever. Um, it's a, an attempt at finding a set of principles for what's good for all humanity. And it's not even just what's good for the United States, by the way. It's supposed it, it's properly an international movement, and uh, that's another point of comparison with the socialist movement, which was an attempt at creating an international movement for uh, humanity at large and not a special interest politics. Now, <clears throat> the growth of the left is an interesting thing to study for libertarians because we were the beginners of the left. What's now the socialist left started out being the libertarian classical liberal critique of the feudal and mercantile privilege that preceded the growth of capitalism in the 17th and 18th century. This kind of radicalism uh, argued that there would be no way we could trust a government with taking on responsible roles for uh, guiding society in noble directions. It, it, it understood that the nature of the state is such that we cannot trust it uh, under any guise of, of uh, better leaders or whatever um, we, ha we have to accept the fact that the very nature of the state means it will be usurped for purposes that we don't ourselves agree with. <clears throat> In other words, this year we may elect someone we like, 
someone who says the things we want, someone like Jimmy Carter who says he's an outsider from Washington and he's going to change everything. He gets in there and he elects, uh, he puts into power all the same people who were there before. Um, Anderson is the same uh, thing replayed. Uh, Anderson, of course, has the support of the Rockefeller clique and all of the major uh, powers that be in the United States today. And he hardly represents an alternative to what exists. But that's the way these Republicans and Democrats are going to be. It's the nature of their kind of politics because they are special interest politics. They're not a radical politics. <coughs> We, we ought to survey socialism because it is an attempt at a radical politics, but it's a failed attempt. I think it, it can be said at this point in history that enough attempts to bring about socialism have been tried for us to indict it as a failure. Um, it's been around for a long time. Marx had finished writing most of his works by 100 years ago, um, and the influence of those works had their effect in this entire century. Although many people won't call themselves Marxists, Basically, Marxian ideas have infiltrated virtually every country in the world. That's not just a socialist bloc, uh, you know, the, those countries that are under the imperial powers of the Soviet Union and China and so on, but it's also the, the whole third world. Uh, every developing country has an attempt at development planning that is totally distorting its economy on the lines that were in many ways suggested by Marx. And even in the West, um, the idea of central planning is really around us all the time. Every politician wants to plan the economy in his own way. And that idea is, is not uh, shrouded in Marxian language here, because you'd obviously lose the election if you did it that way. But it comes from that kind of critique of capitalism, that capitalism is a sort of self-generated order, that no one runs it. It goes along in its own directions. And that's what they don't like about it. They want to tell it what direction to run it in. And politicians love that sort of thing. It gives them power, it gives them prestige. And so um, that kind of thing has, has naturally won over the intellectuals who all want to have a piece of the action, want to um, push the direction in their, in their favored directions. Um, and so you know, that's the way things have been going. But the reason for all of this has been the influence of that Marxian ideology on the modern world. So we mustn't underestimate the, uh, the impact of ideas. That, uh, the, uh, the ideas that were generated by Marx really um, have, have been as influential as those generated by Christ, um, and, and uh, far worse, I think, for the fate of mankind since. <laughs> the, one of the main effects of the Marxian uh, ideology has been that it turned the left, the ideological radical left, from an explicit utopian approach, um, and I'm going to explain what I mean by utopian in a minute, to an, an explicitly anti-utopian approach. Now, a utopian approach is not meant to, to, um, to impugn the approach. To call it utopian is just to say that they were explicit about what their vision was. It used to be the old libertarian left used to come out and say, what we want is a free market, um, we want to end special privileges for businessmen and for labor unions and for everyone. Um, you know, they were explicit about the nature of the future society that all of their policies were uh, intended to promote. One of the major effects of Marxism has been to take that discussion off the table and to say, we won't talk about what the future is like. That's idle speculation of what the future will be like. What we'll do is criticize the present from the standpoint of socialist uh, ideas. Marx himself uh, spent his whole life work um, devoted to a critique of capitalism. Now, it may be that Marx intended for this critique to be carried further to a positive discussion of what socialism would look like, and he, he never finished his, his even the work he intended to do on the critique of capitalism, he never finished, so we can't say what he would have done. But the plain fact is that the Marxists have never done much of that. They have shied away um, almost as if it were a taboo from the discussion of what socialism is supposed to look like. Now, this denial of, of the positive aspects of utopia, that you, you, you know, the good things about describing explicitly what you want, what you're really trying to achieve, without that kind of vision as a guiding um, light for all of your specific policies, you may turn into something just like the moderate special interest politics that surround us. We started out as a radical 
critique which intended to have a principled ideology applied to all issues, and that still was what Marx intended. But because he never talked about what socialism would look like, it became possible for each following Marxist politician <coughs> to choose his own utopia and to not really talk about it explicitly, but when he gets to power to do whatever he wants, which he thinks is what socialism is. Um, Lenin, for example, is an ideal example of a, a person who studied Marxism you know, thoroughly from the beginning to end. He wrote uh, significant contributions himself to advance Marxist theory, but all of it was in, either in revolutionary strategy on how to win the revolution, or it was in a critique of the existing imperialist capitalist world that we all hate. But nothing about what to do afterwards. So what happens? He gets to power, and he declares that we're now going to start constructing the socialist world. And within two years, he had completely destroyed the Russian economy, had no idea where to go next, and ended up by default bringing back a free market, which in the so-called NEP period in the Soviet Union brought back a considerable revival of economic activity for a few years, only to end up being booted out by Stalin and his other uh, cronies, who, of course, brought back the same mercantile, special interest, feudalist type economy that the left had been born to oppose. So the effect of this uh, new socialist form of the left has been to bring us right back to where we started out when the left was born. We're no further ahead now, except that we have a, a more wealthy economy to work with, but we're no further ahead politically than we were a couple hundred years ago. And that is due to the failure of Marxism. Now, perhaps you could uh, discuss the dilemma of Lenin when he came to power and had nothing to do uh, <clears throat> in the form of a paraphrase of uh, a Blondie song that you've seen advertised. And that is, if you don't know where you're going, you don't know what to wear. You have, no you have nothing to do. And Lenin stood uh, intellectually naked um, after achieving political power in, in Russia with no idea what to do. He had nothing to wear. Now, despite the fact that he didn't know what to do, he did have, in a, in a sense, he had a very clear-cut idea what had to be done. <clears throat> that is, the Marxian theory, though it doesn't explicitly talk about what socialism will look like, it nonetheless, within its critique of uh, capitalism, it contains an implicit, fairly specific idea of what socialism would have to entail. So even though he never specifically said, well, socialism will have this, this, and this, <clears throat> nonetheless, he kept saying capitalism has this, this, and this, and that's why it's wrong. And so you can just take his critique of capitalism, uh, sort of turn it on its head, and say, well, this is what socialism must be, be like. If it's going to be not like capitalism in all these respects in which he criticized capitalism, therefore it must have the, the following characteristics. The main characteristic of Marx's socialism was that it would abolish what Marx called the anarchy of capitalist production, which was, for Marx, the nature of capitalism of being unplanned. That is, every production decision that's made in society under capitalism is made by ind independent producers who produce for profit. They don't produce for society as a whole. They don't decide, well, we need more beans, therefore I'll go into bean production. Um, um, you know, there are some people starving because they don't have beans, so I'll be a good guy and I'll go in and make some beans. That's not the way it works at all, and Marx realized that. And in fact, any advocate of the free market realizes that, that businessmen aren't in it for their um, altruistic motives to help out mankind. Um, the, so the production under capitalism is anarchic. Um, this is the reason Marx condemned it, and this is the reason I favor it. Um, it's anarchic, it's, it's uh, self-generated, it's an order that needs no guidance from a central totalitarian body like the state. Um, it needs no guidance from any uh, planning board. It guides itself. The price system is a form of self-guiding activity whereby if people do need beans, they start expressing that fact by demanding more beans, by bidding up the price of beans, and the higher the price of beans goes, the more people want to produce beans in order to make a profit. And so this order, um, as Adam Smith said, by, as if by an invisible hand, people are um, 
satisfied for the demands that they have, even though no one intends to go about satisfying those demands. <clears throat> but since this was the very aspect of capitalism that, that Marx condemned, the fact that everyone made their own decisions separately about how to produce, then the socialism that emerges from Marxist theory must be a socialism that takes away that spontaneous order and in place of it imposes a centrally planned order. The implications of that are that you have to get rid of all prices, all money, all market relations, all competition, all institutions like banks, um, all of these institutions Marx consistently condemned as being contrary to his idea of central planning. Um, in one phrase Marx says um, all that socialism means is to make all of society like a single factory. Now that means he thought of a single factory as a, as a planned, as a nicely planned ordered thing. Here it is in the middle of a, this, this chaotic capitalism there's a factory where the manager can say where everything is going to be done in his plan. He can set out from the beginning to say he will do X, Y, and Z and then he puts people in line to do them uh, according to a definite plan and that's what Marx wanted to have all of society do instead of having to just be one factory. What Marx failed to realize of course was that the thing that makes it possible for an individual factory to be so well planned is that it's in the context of a price system which is so unplanned. It's a spontaneous order that's generated by these movements of prices and therefore the movements of where profit motives push people to, to produce, where they, they give people incentives to produce. It's that spontaneous order which gives the order to the individual islands of planning, as they're sometimes called, the individual factories where a little planning is done of um, sort of ex-ante planning where you set out ahead of time what to do when you do it as opposed to the sort of spontaneous order that's generated in market relations. So, uh, in other words, what I'm saying is that Marx's theory um, fails to understand that the way a factory is ordered is only possible due to the context in which factories are placed, that is, that they're in a market order. Uh, and that, therefore, it is impossible for these individual factories to ever grow to a size where they could take over all of production and plan all of production, which is really what Marx wasn't so much just an advocate of socialism as a prophet of socialism, saying that this is the way things are going, that there's so much centralization going on in the world that eventually there'll be just like one capitalist who will own everything and he'll sell everything to the consumers and, w and employ all the laborers. And in that world, it's certainly easy to jump over to a, a democratic uh, running of this single capitalist firm and then just uh, produce whatever is voted to produce or whatever. I don't, he never said how he should have it produced, but in any case, if you can imagine a single capitalist running the whole economy, then it shouldn't be that hard to imagine a single socialist government running the whole economy. The problem is you can't get to that first stage, that the, the, the centralization that Marx thought would take place can't go that far. It's not just that it has never gone that far and that so, um, you know maybe in a thousand years we'll have that much centralization. But the very workings of capitalism, if they're fully understood, reveal that it will never be logically possible for capitalism to have that degree of centralization where there are no more market relations and co competition among separate owners. Now, further, besides the, uh, the theoretical critique that I've been trying to outline here of, of the fact that you can't have this single owner the single socialist firm that runs everything. Um, that critique, by the way, was basically presented 60 years ago in German and then translated um, at least 45 years ago and uh, still hasn't been adequately responded to by any Marxist since they don't want to talk about what socialism looks like. And it, although it's been responded to by neoclassical economists in the mainstream and they've totally failed to understand what was meant by the original challenge, so they also haven't answered it. So anyway, the theoretical critique hasn't really gotten too far um, in the practical world of changing ideas. However, the, the practical failure of socialism has been so evident that it's hard for anyone to ignore it. 
Um, the, the case of Lenin I've already briefly mentioned, the, the so-called war communism period, uh, right after Lenin took over, he tried to leap to socialism. He tried to abolish markets. He intentionally tried to destroy his, uh, his money, the society's form of exchange that had been traditionally the only way that people order their lives. He tried to systematically, intentionally destroy it. Well, he, he did that, and, um, and the failure of it was so evident that every other, every succeeding uh, attempt in Russia to institute central planning has been a much more moderate view of central planning. It hasn't been a, an explicit attempt to abolish prices anymore. Rather, it's been an attempt to uh, bureaucratize the economy, to make it look like there's central planning. For example, in Stalinist central planning, what you do is... Um, you find out what everyone produced last year, and you bring all these statistics into the central planners, and, uh, and, and then you add a percentage, like 5%, and you say we want to produce 5% more of all these things next year, and you make that your first year of the next five-year plan. That's, that's what we'll do next year. All right. Now, if after the first month that this five-year plan has been instituted, actually, they don't even announce the five-year plan until it's already been in operation for two years. So then, of course, it, it's been conforming for the first two years to the plan because the plan's only published after they have the statistics. <laughs> but let's, let's say um, even after the plan is published, the plan goes through, in some cases it's gone through over 10,000 changes. That's the central plan that, you know, after the first month they find they didn't produce as much steel as they wanted, so they revise what they, they planned. And so by the end of the five years, Lo and behold, they succeeded in matching and even in some places exceeding the goals of the central plan. Now, obviously, what Marx had in mind when he said that society should be planned from the start, should be rationally, scientifically planned, he didn't have this sort of thing in mind. I mean, let's face it, if, if you're going to revise your plan every three months or every two weeks, it's not really an ordered plan. It's really a spontaneous order albeit a spontaneous order that's tremendously interfered with by a governmental bureau that in interferes with every single operation in the economy. So even though I'm saying that the Central Planning Bureau of, of the Soviet Union is not um, dictating to society what ought to be done, nonetheless it's tremendously interfering with those in society who want to do things from letting them do what they want to do. <laughs> Um, and it's therefore keeping them from doing 90% of what they could be doing. It's, uh, for example, pushing the economy in a militarist direction. A great deal of their produced wealth goes, as it does here, to waste on uh, missiles and things that nobody can use, while the people barely have television sets or cars or any of the conveniences we're pretty used to here. Um, and and uh, besides the... Uh, the case of war communism and that failure that turned into Stalinism. There's another illustrative case in Cuba where um, Shea's brother, Ernesto uh, Guevara, was the minister of planning um, around the early part of the 60s. And he also, um, he looked back on the history of what had already happened in war communism. And he was a great devoted <coughs> reader of Lenin, for example. Um, and he looked at all that, and he read Marx, and he said, well, look, what they did wrong in war communism was they didn't stick to it long enough. They only tried this complete central planning for two or three years, um, and so it didn't work, and then they came back to market forms, and they allowed prices and all these evil things. So what we have to do in Cuba is be even more dogged and bring about socialism with, with more fervor and so uh, achieve what the Russians failed to achieve. And Cuba, of course... Um, we need not say too much about uh, the people who are escaping from it, I think, are voting with their feet about what kind of economy they have. They have also degenerated into a Stalinist-type model. They gave up, finally, on trying to eliminate prices and money and ultimately uh, settled for having a tremendous bureaucracy interfere with production rather than take over production. And so there is another case of the uh, evident failure of socialism. The, the worst part of the failure of socialism, probably, though, is not just that it's economically absurd, that it's never worked, and that it leads to some kind of economy that's 
uh, a fraud that it claims to be central planning but doesn't achieve any kind of central planning at all. That's not really the worst part of it. The worst part is that when you try to institute socialism and fail because it doesn't work, you end up instituting the same old privileged system that the left was born opposing. That's the worst part, is that we brought back the prisons, that Russia has the same kind of czarist relationship between the government and the people that they had before the Russian Revolution, um, that people are being tortured for reasons of uh, socialist ideology. But this is what the radical left has come down to. It's not just that it fails economically, but that the attempt to fail, to <laughs> attempt to fail, the attempt to bring about this, this uh, necessarily failing system, uh, brings about a system that does work in a sense. I mean, it doesn't completely collapse like the the real consistent socialism does, but instead it it, it permanentizes a bureaucratic police state that can't be unseated without another revolution. Now. Uh, Lastly, I'd like to recommend as the, uh, as the ideology that guides this next revolution, the libertarian radicalism. The main uh, advantage of this radicalism is that its basic economic system upon which everything else is built works. We know that the free market works. Any study of history will show that the freest economies are the ones that produce the most wealth, they sure, uh, we have to agree, they don't uh, achieve complete equality, which was one of the goals of the, the new socialist left. We can't promise that everyone will have the same amount of wealth, the same amount of opportunities, the same amount of education, and so on. But that, I, I would just say, is an impossible goal. Um, if every attempt to achieve that kind of complete equality has failed, then maybe we ought to lower our sights a bit and try to achieve something that at least is possible. Besides the question of whether it's even an, an advisable goal to equalize everybody. I mean, if we look at the people around us, do we really think that that's what everyone wants, to have the same kind of house and the same kind of education and the same kind of drugs and everything else? Uh, I don't think that's what people want. I don't think people want the same thing at all. In fact, um, a lot of the inequality of wealth that the left complains so, so bitterly about is a chosen inequality. There are many people like myself who could have ways of earning more, much more money than I earn, who turn them away, turn them down, who say, fuck that, I don't, want to, I don't want to compromise in all the ways that are necessary to achieve that amount of wealth. And so I consciously take an inequality of wealth, I consciously choose to be poor, I'd like to be richer than I am and still you know, do the things I like to do, but nonetheless, it is a very serious sense in which we choose to be about as wealthy as we are, in the sense that of all the goals we choose, we have to turn some down because we don't like them. And we have to choose others, even though we don't know whether we'll succeed financially or not, because we think we'll like doing that. And being able to choose those directions for our life is probably more important to us than whether or not we have as many cars as our next door neighbor. The, the left has, has uh, been born with both of these ideals. I mean, we started out with purely uh, equal under the law kind of ideals, saying that we should all be equal only in the sense that, you know, the, the legal privileges given to any one of us are the same as those given to everyone else. And that equal under the law has gradually turned into a, some kind of equality of, of status, equality of wealth. <clears throat> and that latter uh, goal has, has failed to, to be achieved. Thus, uh, I would advocate that we work toward a libertarian radicalism that can work, that we advocate the free economy as the basis for all of our other goals, um, that as long as people are free to uh, engage in whatever economic activities they please, then they'll also be free to engage in such economic activities as selling drugs or uh, porno mags or whatever else they like to do, uh, and also the free economy indicates that there'll be not too much consumer demand for, say, MX missiles. Um, that <laughs> just, just taking the government out of the direction of the economy is a sufficient grounds for bringing about a tremendous demilitarization of our, <coughs> of our society. So I think this fundamental redirection of the modern radicalism back toward its roots 
in the classical liberal traditions and the, the original left, the vision of the free market and free uh, freedom in our personal lives as well as an anti-imperialist attitude about the rest of the world, um, those things in combination all can come out of our economic uh, basis in the free market. So I think that's the direction that uh, the left ought to start looking back at. Thank you. We'll take whatever questions you have. So, in, I, I, in all fairness, I'm as much of a critic of uh, socialism and the state as I think anyone else in this room. But the primary gist, of, for purposes of clarification, the primary gist of criticism was and is uh, the varieties of state socialism, of Stalinism, Maoism, Castroism, and other. Uh, theories of society employing the state as the tool of planning, right. thus virtually seeing to it that the state itself or the society became at best a, as you said, an extremely bureaucratized, hierarchical society, and at worst, like in Cambodia or Angola or Mao Zedong's China, one giant death camp. Uh, but there are other varieties of socialism that which uh, developed well, co-extensively with Karl Marx, the anarchists, the uh, communal anarchists of Proudhon and Bakunin, uh, uh, certain uh, humanists, uh, uh, the uh, uh, religious traditionalists, men like uh, uh, Cardinal Newman, uh, which, which looked upon uh, morality and uh, non-status <coughs> versions of voluntary relationships. Uh, the libertarians have any particular have libertarians formulated any particular opinion on? Uh, well, the yeah, I think socialism of the left <coughs> rather than the right wing socialism. Right. Uh, I, I think in many ways uh, modern libertarianism has uh, roots that, and some of which they can be proud of in the. Uh, anarchist socialist uh, left. Pe some, some of the writings of people like uh, Proudhon, for example, are very impressive. I mean, they sound like libertarianism in a lot of passages. Unfortunately, I don't think he had a sufficient understanding of, of uh, the way economies work to, to, uh, to make a consistent program. And it's, it's really hard, in most cases, an anarchist socialist just, uh, in my view, doesn't al also doesn't know what he's uh, going to wear. Um, he, he doesn't have a good idea of what would happen after he achieves power, if that's the way he sees himself, as, uh, or at least gets rid of the state power that now exists. He doesn't really know what's going to happen afterwards in most cases. I'd be glad to talk to any uh, anarchist who could tell me more of what they do want, and in many cases, when you argue with them, after a while, it appears that they want what, you, what libertarians want. In that case, I'm, I'm glad to have argued with them. But there are many other cases where really, really what they're saying is they want to get rid of the what Marxists call unearned wealth or exploitation. Uh, that is, things like earning of interest and uh, earning of rent and profit. They, um, people like Proudhon attack those kinds of incomes, say that that's not fair, it's not good. Um, Proudhon thought with a free banking system, you could abolish interest. So when people pay loans, people take loans, they don't have to pay back an extra amount of money. Um, now, I think that just shows a blatant misunderstanding of the nature of giving loans. If you, you can't give someone money and not get anything back, otherwise you'd never loan anyone any money. I mean, you, there's some disutility to not having the money in the meantime, which has to be paid for, and that's all that interest is. But Proudhon thought of interest as some sort, sort of state creation that only existed because we had governments. And so he misunderstood the, the very nature of these c kinds of economic categories, and as a result, parts of his condemnation of capitalism were misstated and, I think, um, led socialists in the wrong direction. Um, so, you know, some of these critiques I'm now using of the anarchists actually were formulated by Marx himself. I mean, Marx studied classical economics and he realized what the implications of being against the taking of interest are. You, you can't just be against interest and still be in favor of market relationships because certainly people are not going to give any loans 
if they can't earn interest. And Marx realized that. So what he wanted to do was get rid of all market relations and therefore he wouldn't have any interest to worry about because no one would be giving loans in the first place. The government would just decide what to produce. If that's impossible, however, even from within Marx's system, it may look like the, be the next best thing is a free economy where people do, in fact, earn interest rather than uh, stepping backwards into the Middle Ages and bringing back the, uh, uh, you know, the, da the days of torture chambers and everything else. And the, the Cambodian example w is the ideal example, I think, of modern socialism, which I'm sorry I didn't mention when I was listing their horrors because there, there has been probably nothing to compare with it in the 20th century. The destruction that these people, in the name of uh, so-called radical ideology, uh, brought to their people is uh, shameful. Of course, they, they were probably what was, po was possible there under Pol Pot was only possible mainly because of bombings by Nixon and Kissinger, which you know led to the situation where some sort of radical politics along socialist lines was the sort of thing that was possible. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, nothing can excuse an ideology for yielding that kind of result, in my view. Well, I, I have two things to say about that. First of all, um, even within what you say, I think the logical policy conclusion for today would have to be libertarianism. Because if what you, you seek is to so advance capitalist production to bring about enough wealth to make it possible or even conceivable that we take over all wealth consciously, that we plan all production according to Marxist theory, that if that's the goal you seek, then the best way to achieve that is through capitalism. If we, th therefore, bringing, taking away state privileges, reducing the power of government, that's the way we should be pushing right now. So even within Marxist theory, I think the direction for present policy ought to be a libertarian direction. Nonetheless, um, this standard uh, uh, view of the, the Russian situation, that it was not just wrong but premature, in other words, the Russian economy was agricultural. Marx had said it should come out of the mature capitalism as fully industrialized capitalism. Therefore, the only reason Lenin failed was because he was dealing with such a backward economy. I, I think a study of the failure of war communism shows quite the contrary, that the failure of his regime was precisely in the, the most developed parts of the Russian economy. It was in the cities, it was in the factories where complete chaos reigned during war communism, where he totally failed to organize production in the most advanced parts of his economy. It was the only part that kept going was the agricultural sphere, where peasants were able to hand-to-mouth existence, were able to continue producing, only to have a, a more than half of their production be stolen by the city, city dwellers through requ requisitioning that Lenin imposed after the people were starving in the cities because his, fa his failure uh, had been so extreme where uh, advanced production was taking place. So I think, <clears throat> regardless, I, mean, I think it's true what you say that Marxist theory wasn't really tested in the, in the Russian case because, strictly speaking, Marxist theory only applies after capitalism has developed all of the necessary conditions for socialism to take over. And m among those conditions are that it's possible to so that everything is so centralized that it's possible to switch over to a democratic centralization. Now, the, we've never seen anything close to that degree of centralization. The degree of centralization that Marx thought was taking place in his time has really not progressed much at all beyond what it was at his time. In fact, most of the centralization that's taken place has been of a completely different kind. It's been bureaucratized state centralization like it had been even before Marx. So and things haven't gone the way Marx had predicted in the first place. Um, so certainly nothing has been prepared. No, no road has been prepared for socialism any more than it was then. 
and therefore I don't think socialist policies of trying to bring down the capitalist system like, like uh, massive general strikes, uh, for example, I think that's a stupid policy. I think it just destroys the economy and it's not going to get you anywhere. Also, the policy of bringing some uh, Lenin to power and having him try to institute a socialism is foolish because clearly we don't have the conditions prepared. But also, I think if we really study the failures that have taken place, albeit they were not strictly according to Marxist theory, but if we study those, uh, those examples, everything points to the suggestion that it's really advanced production that can't be centrally planned. It's not agricultural production. You can, to, to a great degree, you can plan agricultural production because it's so simple. There's so little that has to be taken into account that it can be consciously subsumed under a plan and dictated um, within certain, uh, you know, when it, within a certain framework, you can do that. Even there, there's been a lot of chaos and, mis and mis uh, misallocation and graft and uh, everything else. Yeah, well, in modern in modern society, even the agricultural sectors are so dependent on the uh, industrial sectors that if you destroy your industrial sector, you're going to also eventually destroy agriculture. But the way it has happened has been that the most industrialized, most advanced, most centralized parts of the economy are the ones that fail most miserably in attempts to bring about socialism. So I think that would be the way I'd redirect my argument at a more uh, more strict Marxist view. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I think we're further. Well, the problem is, I think it's uh, you'd never get there. In other words, what I, my, I had two points in my answer, and my first point was to say we'd at least get closer if we were toward liberal capitalism. Even within Marxist scheme, that would be better. And so, in that sense, I would agree with you that before the New Deal, we were at least closer to Marx's ideal of socialism then, because at least we had more. Uh, a, a more liberal capitalism, which was closer to what Marx saw as the preceding stage to socialism. But, since I don't think you could ever centralize to that degree, I think it's built into the nature of capitalism that there is a degree of decentralization, because that decentralization is what moves the price system, and it's the price system that guides every individual capitalist to know what he should produce. So, therefore, I don't think it's the... the uh, progression that Marx foresaw is a possible way of going. And, and so, you know, it's almost academic as to whether we ever were close to it, since we could never get it, what's the point of being close to it? We should, we should try to get as much as, as many humanistic goals as we can find in the left we ought to try to achieve, those that are possible. But if we find some that have been tried that seem to be totally uh, utopian in the bad sense of the, the word utopian, then I think we ought to reject them and try to reconstruct our leftist radicalism <coughs> to be something that we can we can really achieve. Yeah. Doesn't it all come back to this too that where you try to institute a system depending on a division of labor, you need a meaning of exchange. And the market economy coordinates finer and finer subdivisions in that division of labor. And the reason you do that is that you can gain more by subdividing the gain more in exchange and you can if you practice the ordinary of self-sufficiency and make everything yourself. Mm -hmm. And the problem seems to be this, that, uh, and since this is a dynamic system, since knowledge is decentralized, and innovation can come in and be put into the marketplace for a head, you can sort of use resources over the long term more efficiently and create quite a bit of wealth. But if you think that you can then, after a certain point, take over this whole system and then reduce it back to sort of a tribal basis, some kind of central planning, some kind of more target, uh, you know, vision, then in fact that division of labor is just destroyed. And the only reason that socialism works anywhere at all in this world, quote unquote, work, is that it has the capitalist world as a proxy for its prices and uh, for its activity. So it uses, well, it uses the capitalist world, it uses commodity market exchanges. I mean, how can you tell whether copper should be more than gold? Well, you can sell a free framing market. So, of course, if you, if, you, if, you had, if you had, if you, because Lenin said that. Uh, at one time, gold will be used to find urinal. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Senator, who's the senator from um, uh, Wisconsin? Royce. 
said that when gold was uh, demonetized, it should fall to about $6 an ounce. So well, this shows this very unrealistic notion of what's going on when people do decide, well, we'll not be self-sufficient, so we'll trade on those things that we have comparative advantage in, and then do <coughs> society spontaneously of that nature. This is the notion. Then taking it all over again, when it's industrialized, it can in fact destroy it. And do it oh. right back to bottle well, I should point out that Marx actually wanted to have this whole world-integrated advanced division of labor and advanced scientific technology. He wanted all of these as products of capitalism, but he also wanted to consciously plan all of it. And I think that's where... Th it wasn't as if Marx wanted to return to a primitive communism, a primitive kind of uh, autarkic society. He really didn't want that. That's probably the main consequence of attempts to achieve socialism, but his goals were to include all the advantages of this advanced form of production. Uh, I think he just failed to see that one of, con one of the major conditions of that form of production is the decentralized nature of it and the spontaneous anarchic nature of it, which he condemned. So I agree with, with most of what you said. Yeah. Uh, just, just a second. Just a small point of question of quality of Comes. Um, I, I think Merritt's pointing out that <coughs> people have produced different quantities of, of wealth, and to, to distribute wealth evenly is to. Uh, is to not give people what they produce. Right? I mean, if you to, say. To, to not allow people to retain right. what they produce. Well, yeah, but w within socialism, presumably, everyone produces everything and sort of plants their production in a, in, a, in a great distribution hall, and then it's all distributed out to everyone. So the state owns everything, but the state distributes it all fairly. And uh, what you're saying is an important problem with socialism is this so-called incentives problem that, uh, you know, if you can't get back what you produce, then you're not going to want to produce well, as much, And right? So m moreover, though, you, you're saying... Well, gee, you know, sorry, we, we, we can't uh, promise, you know, we as, as libertarian free markets, we can't promise to follow the income. Right. I, I think it merits, if you're going to apologize for that, you should, you should point out very quickly that you're going to have a free market, that, that you can't have a quality of incomes and a nonviolent society. Be because a quality of incomes implies that some force of agent is, is going to remove from the producer of relatively great amounts of wealth, uh, a large portion of that wealth, by force. Yeah. Uh, a socialist might respond, to be fair to him, uh, a socialist might respond that uh, the whole mentality of people under socialism will be so different that everyone will be generous with his wealth, and he'll want to produce a lot and then give it all to people who just for the sake of the argument and make our case the best, the strongest possible case, and then uh, go on to point out these additional matters that, uh, you know, practically speaking, people probably are not going to be so altruistic and so on. Uh, yeah. They have entire factories hidden away in the hills that produce, uh, you know, complex production goods that hire people on the sly and pay market wages, black market wages. Like they, they once busted uh, an entire factory that was producing women's underwear in the hills of uh, Russia, somewhere outside of Moscow, somewhere. <laughs> because you know the, the official state didn't sanction all these capitalist uh, frivolities, and so <laughs> people had to go get it on their own. I think that it's important to study the black markets of, of a society like socialism because the black markets are really the bulk of the economy. If you, if you take black market in the widest term, including so-called gray markets and everything else, because if everyone had to conform to the plan that's published, they would never publish anything. What they do is they, they bend it, and then the planners realize the bends and you know go back and bend their plan appropriately and so on. So it's all of these... these uh, the, the ways people 
work around the central planning system that enables the whole thing to work. And so the black market there is really the, the market. Um, in the United States, the black market is usually a small portion of it, but similar laws apply to both kinds of black markets. That, like, the more strictly you enforce the laws against some product, the higher the price of that product is, and the more incentive there is to, for people to produce it. For example, the price of heroin is so high that people, in order to buy it, have to go out and steal and do all sorts of things. And the same thing applies to the price of uh, brassiers or something else. You know, if you make anything illegal, it's going to be more expensive to produce it because you have to evade the police, and that means that there are going to be more people demanding it at the higher price. Um, you know, there'll be more people trying to produce to achieve that profit. So it really achieves the opposite of its intended purpose. The more things you make illegal, the more profit there is to go into that kind of production. Yeah. important to point out, though, that the, uh, to a great extent, the central planning of the Soviet Union is kind of a fraud, though. I mean, you know, it, it's true that officially the state owns everything and every manager is only a, a subsidiary to the, the czar, <laughs> but um, that, that's the legal technicality of it, and there's some truth in it. But to a great degree, managers earn profits, too. They, to a great degree, they direct their own production and try to make uh, profits within the, uh, the network of production. You know, they, they uh, for example, sneak products off from other factories and disguise the figures in the plan so that they, no one realizes that they did it. And so there, there are a lot of profit motives going on in this production system, and it's not as uh, socialistic as the uh, advocates would have it. In the Cuban economy, after the failure of social, so, socialism, as you mentioned, in the 70s, there was a, a, mis a, a redirection of, of the economy. In, in the last few years, the one thing that they're trying is precisely what you're saying. Uh, they're setting the quotas for, say, an agricultural co op, and they say that they can keep everything after it. Yeah. So it's over, over and above that quota. And uh, unfortunately for the Cuban economy, for the, for the communists in Cuba. The, what, uh, together with that, they passed another law that said that you cultivate a, a big profundity or something like that, maybe at less than a 200 square feet or something like that. You can keep all that for yourself. And uh, most of the food in Cuba is coming from this 100 square feet law. Right. Same thing, of course. That it's, it's often quoted in statistics of the Soviet Union that the whole agricultural system of the Soviet Union is supported by private plot agricultural uh, farmers, you know, peasants who grow their land on their own uh, have a great incentive to grow more land and they'd be glad to sell it to people who buy it and that's what produces, but the bureaucratized system has been a total failure. Uh, it may uh, also be mentioned, uh, I came in late, maybe you did discuss this, but one of the points that libertarians think uh, were radical liberals in the 16th, 17th, 1800s didn't address uh, adequately was uh, value theory and perhaps also the entire theory of justice, found ethical foundations of private property. And perhaps it would be a good idea if the uh, radical left, it, in, in articulating well-justified opposition to state abuse and 
really apply that properly now that we have a more valid subjective uh, theory of value rather than a labor theory of value or a theory of intrinsic value that yeah. Mill and Ricardo. Right. By, by calling out our, uh, our noble roots in history, our classical liberal origins and so on, I didn't mean to say we should go back to that and, and reject any accomplishments that have taken place in the intellectual growth of libertarianism since then, because I think the one that you mentioned in value theory is very important in economics, that to understand that the source of value comes from individual minds judging the value of things and not from labor that gets put into things because the very value of the labor you put into things depends on the value of the things you get out of them, the subjective value of things perceived by de demanders, by consumers out there. Uh, so I think that's an important way to understand the economy that was lacking in, in our roots. Another important thing that we can now explain that we really couldn't explain in the 18th and 19th century is business cycles used to be a great myth, uh, a great uh, mystery as to what causes these tremendous uh, ups and downs of the trade cycle that were constantly taking place in the 18th and 19th century. Well, now it can be explained on the basis of a critique of a certain kind of banking system that we've had throughout this period of time, and therefore we can advocate a free banking system that lacks that kind of... Uh, unemployment versus inflation choice that we've had. Now it's, of course, a question of having how much of both. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, a libertarian uh, critique of the modern economy, as we'll get, by the way, uh, tomorrow at this time, there'll be a discussion, uh, I hope there'll still be a discussion on uh, inflation and unemployment and all this, which will give a, a, a modern libertarian critique of that kind of system and show why in a free society, we won't have massive unemployment. Um, another point that uh, Chris jotted down that uh, I should mention, which is a good point, uh, that what, when we condemn so-called collectivism from a libertarian point of view, uh, it should be pointed out that all we're condemning is this total collectivism that tries to bring all society under a central plan and so on. It's not as if we're against communes, you know. It's not as if we're against people getting together in a group and deciding that they want to share their product, that they want to work together as a family, sort of, as a non-relational but uh, uh, intimate family. Um, all of these can, there have been many projects, especially by anarchist leftists, um, by socialists who don't advocate more power to the state, but these people have often focused on um, lifestyles and way f ways for individuals to order their lives um, which might be more pleasant. Uh, it might be better than being an isolated uh, hermit or individualist in the complete sense. It might be better to live in a commune and be loved by people. Uh, and that nothing in libertarianism condemns that or even uh, suggests that it's not necessarily good at all. All we're saying is that if you try to bring this collectivism onto the whole of society, then it can't work. Not just that it wouldn't be ethically nice or something, but can't work. And so we have to base our society on decentralized uh, market relationships. And within that uh, framework, you can have all varieties of uh, lifestyles. In fact, that's exactly what libertarianism promotes is the experimentation of alternative lifestyles. Um, w most libertarians are not ready to tell other people how they ought to live. We're not ready to say uh, you can't use this drug or you, you must believe in that religion or you must conduct your life in a certain way. Um, we're not ready to say that. We don't think people have demonstrated in a conclusive way any particular manner of living that's good for everyone. Uh, it seems to be uh, the case that different people live better under different kinds of arrangements and what we need is more in experimentation, more freedom and allowing more varieties of lifestyles. There's a great little pamphlet uh, that I usually distribute free because I bought a bunch of them but I forgot to bring them today by Lysander Spooner who's one of the great anarchists in uh, the 19th century. Uh, he was an individualist anarchist but his uh, one of his pamphlets is called Vices Are Not Crimes. And his whole point in that essay 
is to show that what what some people in in advocating their way of living life call vices are what other people might call virtues and the only thing that we should socially decide upon that we should mandate are the ultimate restrictions on each person's action which must be restricted in order to have peace and prosperity in society. In other words, we have to keep people from murdering each other. We have to keep people from stealing one another's wealth. Um, and we have to keep people from forcing their ideas on other people. But within these broad constraints, everything goes. Anything you want to try, as long as it's not hurting anyone else, then more power to you. Um, another thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if we're running out of time or not. Um, what was the other thing I wanted to mention? Uh, are there any more questions while I'm thinking? Uh, it's up till one four. Yeah. Oh, um, a, a part of the uh, the socialist critique of the modern world has always been a, a, a powerful critique of the existing political structure in the third world. Um, some libertarians, although I don't mean to impugn anyone in this room, but there are some libertarians who haven't fully recognized the implications of radical libertarianism for the third world. They are at least as radical as the socialists have, uh, have argued. When we say we believe in private property, um, we're not saying we believe in existing private property titles, that we would defend to our death every existing owner of property, no matter how he got his wealth. Um, for example, libertarians would not have defended the slave owners, in, uh, to take an extreme example. We don't defend the property rights of slave owners. We don't defend the property rights of feudal lords who got their property historically by military subversion over the peasants who originally owned the land. Um, and that's the, mili that's the sort of economic military structure in most of the developing countries. There are these feudal lords who only have their land because their great-great-grandfathers had stolen it from the peasants who now work it. And the peasants have no rights whatsoever. They're uh, completely vassals of the, peasant, of the lords who are owning the land. And some libertarians, or so-called libertarians, have actually tried to defend the property rights of these lords. Now that, and that's a total subversion of the whole idea of private property rights. Um, for example, the, the Rhodesian whites who stole great tracts of land from blacks um, a number of years ago, um, and now maintain political power, even now, although it's a sort of uh, a mushy uh, intermediate uh, system of power that they have with the blacks now, but still the property rights of these whites is, ma is maintained and protected by the existing government. And uh, a libertarian would go much further than uh, many leftists would go in saying that we advocate the complete private property of the genuine owners of all of that land, peasantry. the peasantry who were originally kicked off the land. And so I think the radical implications of libertarianism to the developing countries could motivate a very important international libertarian movement, um, which instead of imposing this ugly developmental planning system, which you know replaces one kind of colonialism with another in these countries, we instead could really give these people the kind of development model that would produce wealth in unprecedented ways. Um, I think it's important to, for example, compare uh, the developing that took place where relative freedom was permitted, such as in uh, Hong Kong, for example, uh, with the development that took place where uh, socialist policies were dictating and where conscious developing was considered the aim of the government and all its policies were, were directed toward uh, increasing the industrialization of the country, increasing the investment in uh, such things as nuclear power plants and steel plants and so on. Um, India is the prime case of a, de of a development planning country. And uh, of course, India has much 
greater uh, natural resources than Hong Kong, which is a little rock, has no nothing you know naturally grown there. It's all it is is a free port. It has nothing to sell anybody. So obviously, according to development planning theories, uh, Hong Kong is uh, <coughs> is not even worth trying to develop. It's a waste. Um, you can at least start somewhere if you have an India with a, a great number of trees that you can cut down and you can do something with. But Hong Kong is, is, is futile. And yet, Hong Kong has seen the greatest rise in the wage rate the, of the real working masses in Hong Kong of any place in the world. They've had almost un completely unrestricted immigration. So people have been flooding there from China and from Indonesia and from other places. Um, all of these, you know, unskilled people who can't speak the language, who have no um, no particular uh, trade to sell to the to the rest of the populace, and yet these people have all been absorbed by the continuously growing Hong Kong economy, and uh, the production of Hong Kong is unprecedented in that part of the world. It uh, shames the red Chinese, who of course. Uh, depend on the economy of Hong Kong now, um, which is, you know, this little rock sitting next to it. I think that, that nothing could illustrate more powerfully, it seems to me, that just letting people be free to do whatever they want, even if they don't have anything to sell anyone, they have their hands and they have their minds and they can produce with those things. And uh, if you just allow them to produce, they can do a tremendous amount with no resources at all. Well, yeah, I think it bears pointing out, but I would say, um, first of all, I would say I agree that it's bad that we have the welfare state here and that that serves as some sort of incentive for people to come here. I would rather that people came here only to be free to do whatever they want. But perhaps the best way to smash the welfare system is to make it totally unworkable. Um, opening the borders would certainly do that. Um, and al also, I think it, uh, it points very starkly at, at the, uh, the fraudulent nature of the humanitarian motives that underlie the welfare state. Here we are keeping out the people who are poorest all around the world, here in the richest country in the world, and we're saying for humanitarian purposes, we can't let anyone else in so that we can keep paying our uh, people so they can buy another color TV and, and drive their ca Cadillac around. When, when you know, most of the people in the world can't even eat. They can't even get through the next day. Now, that is really sick. It, it seems to me if you're going to be humanitarian, the first thing you want to do is let people go wherever they want and try to produce for themselves. You know, if you can't even let them come in here and work for a job and try to make it on their own. What kind of humanitarianism is that? Um, another point, I think, re relating to that uh, question is that despite the fact that we have this great incentive of a welfare system to come to, the statistics are remarkable that um, a tiny proportion of the people who flood into the United States actually ever get welfare. You can't get it legally uh, because if you're an illegal, illegal alien, you can't get it. You get welfare? Yeah. No, I'm not aware of that. There, 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 perhaps you don't get in the welfare role, but there's a lot of uh, government handouts. That, uh, well, like, like there was a there was a study. All right. There, yeah. Welfare. I meant by welfare the you know the standard I welfare mean, system. I mean, you're government you're government saying government in general all government services, and yeah. so certainly there are some that aliens too benefit from. But the fact is that 90% uh, of them work, pay taxes to this system, and don't ever get any of the benefits. 
never get the unemployment insurance and the regular welfare. Uh, and, and if you look at, there have been studies done on people within the United States side of the Mexican border where there are a tremendous proportion of the workforce is Mexican. And those people are the, some of the hardest working and uh, only less than 2% in one of the studies, I think in San Antonio, um, were getting any substantial kind of welfare aid. Because these people are coming from some, a place where they can't get any decent job at all. And they'll work for much lower wages than the average American would consider decent. And uh, they'll think that they're, gr they're really well off. That immigrants have a higher mean income than the Native Americans? No, I don't think that's true. That's true. According to the New York Times, that's true. Yeah. That immigrants have a high. Oh, after ten years, that. Right. Well, that. Ten years, or after ten years. Yeah, I can see that. Oh yeah. That that point I agree with. The fact of whether they're wealthy or not is different from whether they're net taxpayers. But and after ten years, I can agree that they might be wealthier, but certainly not when they first come here. They're some of the poorest people in society. In fact, one of the effects of the welfare state uh, is that the people who um, the people who come here have to, you know, the, one of the effects I should say of the immigration laws is that people can't legally work uh, for the kind of wages that they could work if there was free competition because their employer can always make one phone call to the INS and say, hey, look, this guy who just complained about his wages um, is, doesn't have a legal green card and such and such and so and so and he gets booted out of the country. So every worker who doesn't have completely legal status in the United States is really what the Marxian calls an exploited worker. He really ha is completely under the gun of his employer who uses the state to keep him in his place. And so to that degree, I would agree wholeheartedly with the Marxian working class ideology and say, um, let's free these people and allow them to work for a free wage. <laughs> Also worth pointing out, actually, I don't know what you say to certain extent, it's also worth pointing out that there's a demand for shortage of labour uh, to perform agricultural tasks in the southwest of America is so great that in fact a wages earned by Ill illegal immigrants, mainly Mexicans, is higher than the minimum wage. This just reflects the demand for labour, actually. Yeah. The demand for agricultural labour. I read uh, the other day a, a really good book on um, the immigration situation in the United States. And uh, unfortunately, it was it, it came well. Fortunately, it came to the right conclusion that we should open up the borders. But um, it came to the wrong conclusion on other related issues, such as the welfare state. For example, it was complaining about the fact that some illegal aliens don't get the minimum wage, and it was saying that we should open up the borders and then enforce the minimum wage and make sure everyone gets such and such living decent uh, standards. Of course, if you did that, it would there wouldn't be a welfare state anymore. It would be so totally bankrupt trying to pay the unemployment benefits of all these unemployed workers who can't earn a minimum wage, um, who are just streamed in from places where they couldn't earn anything, um, that the whole system would collapse. So you have to, very important that libertarianism is a whole system and all of its, the parts of its advocacy connect with each other and it works as a whole but it may not necessarily work all that well if you only take parts of it. And uh, that's why I agree with the, the thrust of your point that we really ought to work to get rid of the welfare system as well as the immigration laws. I just wouldn't want to make a requirement that we do one first because I think we should push on every front we can like win. It's worth mentioning, however, that to a very great extent we could have double-digit unemployment along with high inflation, even if there, w even if, uh, there were uh, no, uh, even if there were no immigrants at all. The 
unemployment and inflation, the uh, the uh, slums, some of which uh, in the South and Southwest are truly dreadful, are the result of conscious policies pursued by uh, democratic welfare statists and Republican conservatives to uh, cartelize and structure the economy towards state ends rather than towards people's ends, toward consumer demand. And even if all the and the same policies would be pursued, whether or not you had uh, Mexicans coming in, in fact, even if uh, even if all the unemployed people were uh, sent out to uh, other countries, God knows where, because of every other country may be even worse than here. But even if all the even if the penalty for becoming unemployed in the United States were to be uh, sent to Africa or Asia or Israel or whatever, these same policies would just uh, produce a whole crop of new unemployed and a whole bunch of new slums and a whole bunch of everything and a whole and much, much higher prices through inflation of the money and credit supply. So it's just a case of the Carters and Reagans and Andersons and Commoners and Kennedys blame, uh, blaming immigrants for the uh, things that their own policies created. Could you speak up? Yes. Um, the only thing is it should be uh, all of that radical sounding rhetoric has to be qualified with the fact that we don't always know who the proper title should go to and if we don't know the, they have to default to whoever is on them and as long as we don't prove that whoever's on them is himself a thief but um, you know like in the case of the Indians in many cases there are no records of, of who the descendants of the original victims of the theft were but whenever you can find one I wholeheartedly uh, believe that we should give it back to whoever it, it uh, properly belongs to. Still, at one point, when I, I just to find out that in the Indian society, it was a nomadic society. I live in the, in the plains of the United States. In the plains, but not in the Northeast and yeah. in some other well, parts. Well, we're talking about the North Country, in terms of the North Dakota, Black Indians, like right. they they're getting this. this there, there was no property right associated with land because there was, the, being a nomadic society, they didn't have. So when the white man comes in and pushes the Indian out of something that they don't own, you know, and there was no, so nobody really owned the land. It was, it was a common pool. It was just a matter of, uh, I don't think there's any, any reason for the, the Indian Well, to I haven't fully thought this out, but it seems like one could make a case that they, uh, they were, uh, that they had something stolen from them, even though they didn't have in individual property rights, that effectively they communally owned the area that they nomadically um, harvested for uh, buffalo and other crops. Uh, and uh, so given that situation, it does seem like somebody hurt them pretty seriously when they killed all their buffalo and planted uh, railroads and houses on the land they used to use. So um, I think it, it would have to be argued that um, some sort of compensation ought to be given to people for having this taken away. I'm not sure what, it may not mean bringing back all of it to nomadic use, but uh, it seems like they were hurt, and if we can find victims and, and uh, criminals, we ought to recompense to the best of our ability. One, one can elucidate on this point that it would be much, it, it, from a libertarian perspective at least, I don't know about a Marxist perspective, but from a libertarian and uh, laissez-faire perspective, it would be very, very easy to do this, much easier, because most of the land that the Indians were driven off from, and they uh, were uh, killed off or driven off, is today not even owned by uh, private white ownership, it's in the hands of the uh, U.S. government, the Bureau of Land Management, the Army Corps of Engineers, 
and merely by uh, initiating or reinstituting the Homestead Act of 1862 and you know, throwing the federal land open to competition, uh, you would wind up with a, uh, once again, privatizing, once again, restoring the, uh, the land to uh, rightful owners, which perhaps uh, the law could and should be liberalized for uh, American Indians, but certainly from a laissez-faire perspective, uh, the fact that the land that was stolen from them is now communally owned anyhow by the state apparatus of the United States or Canada or Mexico, well, uh, homesteading it, privatizing it, would be almost the perfect, uh, perfect thing from a libertarian standpoint, because it would also obliterate the state power in that area of the economy, in that area of society. Yes. in my practice it's usually a lot easier to make up a whole new word than to win back a word we lost. <laughs> <laughs> a word like liberal is gone. I don't think we can get it back. Okay, and welfare is the same. don't have a positive view, you say, well, we're against welfare. That's such a strong positive comment. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, wait a second, if you're welfare lazy, you're by the so-called welfare state yeah, well, I think that's the right tactical approach to, right. to get at their, the whole premise of their argument right. that you poor people are better off because they right. get this check but every month and they don't go out and look for a job. Well-being. And people show that this leads to chaos and conflict and all these kinds of, you know, uh, dysfunctional uh, uh, consequences that presumably these policies were originally set up to uh, mitigate and to uh, avoid. You can say, well, you can say, well, hell, you can say, It's the most insecure program in the whole system. Security is called social insecurity. I think an important um, tack to take with uh, a liberal or a leftist who, who still sees the state as some sort of paternal, uh, you know, protector against the ravages of uh, free competition and the fact that people might starve to death and so on. So I think probably the best way to approach them is historically to show who pushed for all of these welfare right. systems. First of all, you know, it was businessmen who pushed for it. It were uh, people who wanted to get, like the unemployment compensation was all pushed for by uh, private capitalists who didn't want to have to pay for their own insurance and so they got the government to pay for it. Um, and Social Security, of course, was just a government program pushed for by...
Could I, if you're going to go to a new point, I had one more point on this welfare issue. Um, the, there's been a tremendous amount of study by the left on the welfare state, criticizing the welfare state. There's a great book by uh, Piven, which uh, goes over the, the situation of the welfare state, showing how it dehumanizes people, how it forces people to stand in line for hours and hours, and then um, treats them it gets into their private lives, um, invades them in the middle of the night to find out if they have a husband sleeping with them or not. In, in a whole innumerable num number of ways, the welfare system completely, uh, it, it takes poor people and puts them in the hands of the state in, in their everyday lives. And I think um, if you, rather than seeing the welfare state as some glorious thing, you know, most liberals are not on welfare rolls and they don't see yeah. what's going on. They, they make plenty of money in a nice, you know, white collar job and they just feel guilty because they're so well off and they walk down the road and they see someone poor. And so they say, oh, of course, the government has to help these people out. Well, when they see what the government does for those people, it might change their mind about the best way to help them out. Um, we, we had to go around. I wanted to go back to when you said that, uh, <coughs> that the only way Marxism would work was under this idea of the new man. And uh, I want to develop a scenario that I think sometimes uh, the Europeans might be thinking of also a new man. Like, you know, <laughs> going go back to, to, to the idea of the communes, I, I wholeheartedly agree that, you know, that people should be allowed to choose their life for that. And, uh, and the whole idea of why communities work versus why communities do not work on a status basis because uh, communities are agreements, voluntary agreements. Because, you know, like uh, in, a, in a state or in a situation like that, each, each commune, as you call large and large, would have to set some type of norms, right? And, uh, and as they become larger, they, they would become, uh, well, not country, but geographically isolated. And so if you don't like the, the moral precepts of the, the commune state where you live, you go to the other one. But those, are, those wouldn't, <coughs> wouldn't that degenerate into the same type of nation state that we have now, where then there would be a need for uh, def a defense, uh, a military defense, because of somehow this new commune state would not, uh, <coughs> what would keep the members of that community state from doing what they do now and intervene in the affairs of the other community state whose moral precepts they don't like. <laughs> well, you know, is that a new, a new libertarian man you know, that, that would, would allow others to, to, to be immoral according to their own... Because I, this is a conflict that I have. I, I don't really know... What yeah, I, I don't know if collect commun communes or collectives or this sort of thing can really be indicted with this sort of uh, scenario as a, as a potential in them because by their nature they're a voluntary association of people living together. They're not really the same as a sort of collective society where the government decides what should be done. So I don't think, uh, I mean, I think any society could degenerate into a state of society. We don't have any guarantees that if we win that we're going to help. No, I was, but I was so say, it, I was your scenario say, uh, could happen but I don't think it's it would be the collective nature of the commune that would bring about all of these evil consequences. It would be the, the relinquishing of the necessary voluntary contract between all commune members. That would be no, where I, it turns into a... I was going to refer as to the communes growing into oh, oh, I, I was state. I was referring to, I say there are, I have certain moral principles that I <coughs> adhere to that are, are offended by the moral principles under which somebody else lives, you know. And now, I respect the right of somebody else to live their lifestyle, but I would be more comfortable in my neighborhood. Oh, you know, sure. That, that would be no, no, yeah. no, of this going on. Sure, so, right, so, uh, so then you move to a neighborhood where they do restrict uh, people from doing correct. it. Correct. I mean, as these things get larger and, you know, the concepts get uh, more universal, then you do come up with states where they have, you know, this state, no drugs are allowed in this state, and if you want to do drugs, you have to go to this state, and, and that type of thing. And what I'm saying is that what, what is this new libertarian man is going to say, well, it's all right for this to do that, but you know, I'm not going to intervene, I'm going to keep him from doing it because I need it more. That's what I'm saying.
Yeah. Well, I, and there's a sense, if I'm understanding what you're saying, like, there's a sense in which I think you're right. That I think even though a libertarian says that sure, um, a company can create a neighborhood that restricts drug use, for example, and uh, the, anyone who wants to be in a neighborhood where their kids aren't exposed to that, sure. And that will emerge in the libertarian society of the future. But, on the other hand, I think in the long-term libertarian future, people are going to become a lot more laid back about stuff like that. I think they're going to say, well, the hell with it. You know, so my kids aren't going to use this. So your kids use it. So what? You know, I think it's attitudes of tolerance, attitudes of tolerance are going to be much, much better under a free society because they'll be so used to seeing it in the newspapers and seeing it around and that it, it will be clear to them that there's no real danger to them if someone else does things differently than you do. <laughs> Actually, yeah, ra the racial segregation is another example. It may be that right now people have been so racialized by a status world that they'll want to live in their separate the conclaves. But I think uh, in the long run, people who are, uh, are legally tolerant with one another become uh, emotionally and uh, practically tolerant with each other. So your, your conclusion is that libertarianism will bring about a new man, hopefully better, you know, with, with enhance with the qualities that we consider as the conclusion is oh, well, we don't know. No fairness. <laughs> Nobody says anything that libertarianism would make you a better person. The point which is emphasized is that people fear when they feel, perhaps unjustly, but when they have reason to believe that there is something to be afraid of. And this fear, this intimidation, comes from, can, can come from many, many sources in a world where one group or another, one individual, one block, one interest group or another has access to the apparatus of coercion in student society. This creates an enormous amount of uh, apprehension, at least some of it is justified. Um, if if uh, a group of uh, green people feel that a group of blue people is going to use the state to exploit them. The, the natural tendency, if only in self-defense, is for the Greens to try to unite, if only to grab some uh, state power to counterattack against the Blues. The same thing is true with communal uh, people versus individualists, gay people versus straights. We won't, libertarians don't believe in making anybody Better, we leave it to a person's individual uh, uh, conscience to do that. But we do place ourselves on the belief that people would rather look at the world confidently and courageously rather than fearfully and suspiciously. Rather, people would rather be happy than miserable. And once there is no state for the blues to uh, exploit the greens or vice versa, there will be less uh, conflict, less reason for whites and blacks or gays and straights or uh, merchants and farmers or Catholics and Protestants or Germans and Jews to be scared at each other. That's all. We, nobody says anything about, you know, a new libertarian minute. Two more questions. One. Did you have one, Greg? Okay, just last question. Uh, you know, I, just, I, I, I would just like to second that sort of by saying it seems like the state is a PR device to confuse and divide a large amount of the population to take the advantage of the blues or the greens of the worst modern. Yeah. And they're more motivated. You said that at the beginning, 
as a whole. And, and yeah, rather than from your own from the point of view, simple. And uh, didn't, I, didn't, I don't quite analyze that too much. Is that the source of the charity? Um, well, I mean, you're saying an individual, uh, individualism is the basis of libertarianism. I don't know what libertarianism is, but I'm kind of into it. But yeah. Um, well, you know, I I think it's a false dichotomy to to set society up against the individual and say what's good for society is not good for the individual, vice versa. And I think really what libertarianism means is showing you that what's good for each of us in our individual lives, that is, freedom to choose our own directions is what's good for society as a whole. It works best historically and it, it leads to the, the best growth economically for society as a whole. So I, I do think we can put libertarianism forward as a great humanistic uh, ideology, as a, an ideology that's good even for altruistic purposes in the good sense of that word in that we really are concerned about the poorest people in, in the worst parts of the world and we want to help them out. And that, that was a noble motives in my view. Uh, individualism shouldn't mean uh, being unconcerned about those who are worse off than you. It really means that you should be concerned and also intelligent about the best ways of helping everyone. And uh, I think libertarianism is consistently good on, on both fronts. On that very positive note, I'd like to thank Don Lavoy. I hope you people can stick around for Dr. Rothbard who will be talking on the crisis of American foreign policy at 2, which is followed by a discussion on the draft, which features Mark Chaffee, who's the acting president of NYU CARD, Alex Reyes, who's director of the National Resistance Committee, and Carol Moore, who was a candidate for Congress, if I'm correct. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, so a little break. Thank you. <laughs>